crush me, make these weak bones strong. Catch me when you know I surely Playing your simple love song, Lord. Good morning, almost, not quite. Tom, there we go, okay, excellent. Good morning, uh, it is good to see all of you this morning. Uh, happy Labor Day weekend to all of you. It's uh, a quiet weekend here in the room. 
so if you're out there live streaming, we are uh, glad you're able to join us in that way. Or if you're watching after the fact online, uh, we do post these on YouTube later in the afternoon. So it's good to see all of you uh, whenever you're here to worship the Lord with us this morning. Uh, there are a few things to bring to your attention. Visitors, we're glad you're here, of course. Uh, we'll be celebrating communion later in our church service. If you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then in a few minutes' time, we'll invite everybody to come forward and collect the items. Uh, also, if you are a, uh, a member of the family here at Prairie View, you're welcome to give your offering in the little black boxes at that time. But if you're a guest, then uh, we don't need to uh, ask you to give anything. Is my microphone still on? I'm having a hard time hearing myself echoing off the back walls. Okay. Good, I see a thumbs up, so. Okay, thank you for boosting it for my own benefit. I appreciate that. Uh, in terms of events, this is one of those alternating weeks where we have the men's breakfast Friday morning out on the patio, so uh, we'll look forward to that. That's 7 o'clock on Friday mornings. Bring your own food, uh, and we'll keep doing that alternating Fridays as long as the weather permits. Also, it's now only two weeks away from our fellowship meal. We're going to try that uh, the current thinking is we're going to be out in the parking lot. We'll mark off some of the parking spaces so we can be out in the open area together on Sunday the 20th. That is also a bring your own food kind of thing. We will have some chairs here available, but if you want to bring your own chairs just to make it easier for everybody, uh, that would be a, a helpful thing to do. Now, uh, we are anticipating doing a fall bonfire in October, uh, weather permitting as well. Last year we got wiped out because of the weather, but uh, we're hoping to do that uh, in the middle of October. So uh, watch the uh, announcements on Friday in the emails and then uh, from Ben midweek for uh, information about that. Now, one of the reasons that I'm up here in person instead of uh, doing a video announcement the way I've been doing some of is there was one announcement I wanted to make face-to-face, uh, eye-to-eye, -face, eye, for uh, everybody's benefit, but especially for the kids. There's an article I read this week about uh, a mother who's got a bunch of kids and just the hassle of getting out of the building into church when it would be just so much easier for everybody to stay home. So if you've been making the trek in with your kids, we really appreciate that. And if you've determined that's not for your family yet, that is totally fine and understandable too. But for all of the kids who are here, we're glad that you're here. For the parents that have been bringing your kids in, we appreciate that. And for everybody else that don't have young kids and have uh, uh, gotten the reminder of what it's like to have young children, it's wonderful to see the people in the room, see the kids here, so we can remind ourselves uh, what it's like to be the family of God together. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to mention before moving into a scripture, we had an elder meeting on Thursday night. And uh, when we were talking through all the things that we, we think about, especially as related to procedures and stuff, uh, it reminded me that when things first went haywire, we did a really good job of trying to communicate as much as possible. And then as we were looking forward to when are we going to meet together, when are we going to meet together, we did a pretty good job then of trying to be very communicative. But now that we've been meeting together for 12, 14, 16 weeks, uh, we don't really have a next step in mind. We don't know when the mask's going to come off. Well, it's going to be months and months into the future. When are you going to be able to re-scramble the chairs again? No plans for that either. And so we really haven't said much about anything because we haven't had much to say, but uh, that doesn't mean that there isn't things to say. We do intend to keep wearing the masks indefinitely, as long as that's recommended. We're going to keep the chairs looking all silly for a long time. We're going to keep live streaming. Uh, theoretically, we can live stream forever, so uh, that'll be with us to stay. But uh, if there are questions that you have about, you know, do we really have to wear the masks? What's going to be like when we get vaccines? What's the church thinking about small groups or, or the fall bonfire or Christmas Eve, which will be here uh, and will probably not be an outdoor service? Uh, if you have questions like that, by all means, send them to us. At least we'll be able to be thinking about them, and if we've already thought about them, then we'll be able to share that with you. Now, uh, we have finished our eight weeks in 1 Timothy, and that was a delightful study. Uh, we got a one-off sermon this time. I didn't want to pick anything from Ruth because I didn't know where uh, Ben was going to aim, so I decided we were going to go for Luke chapter 1. We're going to read the Song of Mary. Now, we go to Luke chapter 1 and read this a few times a year, and uh, maybe some of you might think we go to Luke chapter 1 too often, and you might be right, but I think you're not. And we're going to start here in chapter 1, verse 46, read the whole song, and then we'll pray. Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. 
He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for uh, the chance that we have to celebrate um, a, a weekend dedicated to those who labor. And thank you that uh, labor isn't just something that is uh, a, an unfortunate evil and necessity, but thank you that uh, you were the first laborer. And when you put Adam and Eve in the garden, they were to tend it. And thank you that we have that reminder at the very beginning of the book that labor is uh, a good thing. And when we labor well, uh, whether it's uh, in an employment context or in the home or wherever it is that we labor, that we are imitating you in the ways that we do that uh, that are good and helpful and uh, uplifting and right. And so thank you. We take a weekend each year uh, to remind ourselves uh, of what it is to labor. And thank you that as a church, we can do that in a way that looks to you, who is uh, the giver of work. And uh, thank you that there are many people who have uh, got work that is... Uh, paid and can support families in that way. And uh, please be with all those who are underemployed, unemployed, looking to be differently employed, as it's a challenging season for that. Thank you for the opportunity we had to look at First Timothy. Thank you for the chance we have to take a look at Ruth and uh, all the work that's going on in there from chapter one all the way through chapter four, uh, as it's very much an economic kind of book, uh, but also a family book, but one that is always uh, going back to you and turns our attention quickly at the end uh, to the great plan that you have, not just for your people, but for the sending of your son, Jesus, uh, into that people. And thank you that we can look to him uh, as a laborer and, and one who had a profession and then a ministry. And thank you that we can look to him especially as our Savior. Thank you that uh, the work that he did in his lifetime uh, was sufficient and good and perfect. And thank you that he did not sin so that we could have our sins paid for. Thank you that he was uh, qualified to go to the cross uh, on our behalf to pay our penalty so that we can be gathered together into your family. And thank you that you've given us good work to do as a church. And uh, thank you for the people that uh, do that work and all the ministry teams and the admin team that keeps it all organized. And thank you for our time here in this room together this morning. It's in your great name that we pray, Lord. Amen. All right, kids, it is time to come on down. We'll have Pastor Zach uh, give us the lesson. Uh, sometimes I wonder what the lesson is going to be about. Is it going to be about uh, barley or uh, leveret marriage? Where's Zach going to go with it? And Maybe it'll be an airplane again this week. I don't know. We'll see. So here comes the kiddos. Good morning, guys. <clears throat> I want you to close your eyes, okay, and think of three of your favorite things, okay? Think of three of your favorite things. All right, you got it? You got three things in your head? All right, you can go ahead and open your eyes. Do any of you want to tell me one of your favorite things? What's one of your favorite things? Um, Legos. Legos, that is a great favorite thing. What about you? Do you want to say one of your favorite things? What's one of your favorite things? Soccer. Soccer? Soccer, that's also a great favorite thing. Would you like to share one of your favorite things? That's okay, you don't have to. All right. So hopefully you've got three favorite things in your head, okay? Now what would you do if you went to sleep tonight and when you woke up, your three favorite things were all gone? If it's Legos, your Legos are gone. If it's soccer, you can't play soccer anymore. What would you do? How would you feel? be very sad, right? Yeah, you'd be very sad. Well, that's a little bit like what happened to Naomi in the Bible story that we're going to look at today. She lost three of her favorite things in the whole world. She lost her husband and her two sons. She was really, really sad. And Ruth was really sad, too, because Ruth had married one of Naomi's sons. So Ruth had lost her husband. Naomi and Ruth both had nothing. They were really, really sad. Now Ruth was young, and she could have found another husband. She could have found another husband and started a new family and left Naomi behind. Excuse me. But, but rather than leave Naomi all alone, all by herself, Ruth stayed with Naomi and helped her. She helped to take care of her. She helped to make sure that she had food 
to eat. Ruth showed kindness and faithfulness to Naomi. And it wasn't long at all before someone began showing kindness to Ruth. A man named Boaz owned a field where he grew food. And having heard about Ruth's kindness towards Naomi, Boaz showed kindness by making sure Ruth and Naomi had plenty to eat and that they were safe. And it just so happened that Boaz was Ruth and Naomi's redeemer. Can you say redeemer? Redeemer? Thanks. This means that it was Boaz's job to help Ruth and Naomi. He was supposed to give them food, a place to live, and a family. And that's what he did. As a redeemer, Boaz bought back what had been lost and restored what had been broken. Boaz married Ruth, and they had a baby, and they named that baby Obed, which is kind of a silly name. Naomi had lost her family, but through the kindness and faithfulness of Ruth and Boaz, Naomi's family lived on. Now, one of the things we can learn from this story this morning is the importance of kindness and faithfulness, loyalty. It's good for us to be kind to one another. But more importantly, we can learn how God works, how he accomplishes what he wants, his plans, when we learn the story of Ruth. Because sometimes God works through big miracles, like in the story of Elijah. But sometimes God works through the quiet kindness of people like Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz. Ruth 4.14 says this. Let me open up my Bible. Ruth 4.14 says this. It says, Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without a Redeemer, and may his name be renowned, made famous in Israel. At the end of this story, we see God's wonderful work. He's being kind, and he's rewarding kindness. But most importantly, we see it pointing forward to Jesus, who is our Redeemer, Jesus Christ, who has come to buy back what we've lost and restore what's been broken. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for these children uh, every week that we have the privilege of teaching and training up in the way they should go. Help us as, as individuals, as a church, together, not just as parents, but as an entire church, to lead well, to live well, to set a, an example uh, that our, our actions would match our words, that our uh, orthodoxy would match our orthopraxy, as we learned about a few weeks ago. Um, God, thank you for your kindness. Thank you for the way you work um, through your people and through simple, ordinary faithfulness that uh, it's not always a miracle, it's not always a parting of the sea or bread from the sky or a pillar of fire or a cloud, but sometimes it's just the kindness that we show to one another. And even still with that, God, we need the strength to be kind because that simple kindness can still be so, so, so difficult especially in a world that teaches us to be selfish and indulgent even. Um, Lord, I just pray that uh, we would, again, raise these kids up well, that we would be raising and encouraging one another well in our faith as we grow in our love for you and our love for one another. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. You guys can go back to your seat. Thank you. I think the last time I made that particular climb, I almost wiped out due to uneven stairs, and Joshua was teasing me about it even earlier this week. And he told me that if I were to fall uh, to my demise, he had an eight-second delay where he could stop the recording so it wouldn't make it to the internet. So it gave me a little peace of mind. Um, as we transition now into our time of communion and offering, this past week I was listening uh, I was listening to something and I heard some, they were talking about politics and I have zero desire to get into anything political from this stage this morning. But one of the points that was made at the end of this long conversation 
with the, the news we read, the stories we listen, or we're reading, the things we're watching on TV, what, the commercials even that we see, to ask ourselves as Christians three, three questions. The first question is, what is this thing, this story, what is it teaching me to love? What is it telling me I ought to care about? The second question, what is it teaching me to hate or fear? And the third question is, what is the good life that it is promoting? What is this thing's idea of the good life? As we come to our time of communion and offering, those three questions are answered in a very, very important way. The first question, what are we taught to love? Well, we're taught to love the Son of God who laid down his life for us. We're taught to love God who sought us when we were sinners, who sought us when the price that was owed was death, was our body and blood broken. What does it teach us to to hate? What does it teach us to fear? Well, it teaches us to hate sin. It teaches us to hate death. It teaches us to hate those things, to stand in opposition to them. Every single week, just the ordinary practice of communion is teaching us something to love and teaching us something to hate. And it's showing us the idea of a good life, which is sacrifice, laying our life down, picking up our cross, following Jesus in service of him him, and in service of others. And that, again, that stands in stark contrast to so many other messages we might receive. And it's not that every single message out there is evil. It's not that every single thing out there is bad. It's that what often happens is we take good things and we lift them higher than they ought to be. And we take things we don't like and we shoot them lower than maybe they ought to be. And we lose sight of what the good life really is, what we really are supposed to love and what we really are supposed to hate. Uh, Thinking back to the end of 1 Timothy, there's a, a, a little couple of verses there that stuck out with me, and I'd like to just revisit them this morning. It's 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 8. It says this, but godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing with this, excuse me, with these, we shall be content. Paul is writing to Timothy and he is able to say these things because of what he knows he has in Jesus Christ, what he knows in the communion that we take, that every need he could possibly imagine has been met for him in Jesus Christ, and that if he doesn't have it, then he doesn't need it. God is a generous and merciful and caring God. I guess I don't want to leave out the offering either. When we come forward in a little bit, after I'm done, and we'll pray, and you'll take the cup and the juice. It's all one package together. If you have an offering, you can leave it in the box. And again, if you're visiting with us, you don't happen to know this, anyone is welcome to take communion so long as you are a believer in Jesus Christ. But when we come forward with the offering as well, it's also answering those three questions. That we love God with our money. We trust him and give him what we have. We, we hate greed and the, the gathering of hoarding of wealth, and we don't need to do those things. And that the idea of the good life is right back into what we talked about with communion. It's that laying our lives down, trusting that God has and will continue to meet every need. That's why we can have contentment. That's why we can read something like 1 Timothy 6 or go to Philippians where he mentions the idea of contentment there as well. And we can have contentment, not made up, not pretending, but a real contentment that God is giving us what we need. That is what we should love, what we should hate, and what the good life is. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, help us to be conformed to the image of your Son. There are so many other things that are 
us and pulling us throughout the week, whether it's things we're seeing on, on our screens, conversations we're having, just so many, so many different things pulling at, pulling at our hearts. Give us the wisdom to navigate, navigate those things well, to find you in those, to, to see how you might be working on us in those messages, in those stories, in those things we're seeing. And in all of that, Lord, I, I just pray that you would help us to cling to the cross, uh, that this isn't a matter of us earning salvation. It's not a matter of being good enough. It's about receiving what you've done for us, uh, seeing the love that you poured out for us, and letting that fill our hearts in turn with love that then pours out, and it, it hates sin, it hates evil, it hates wickedness, it hates injustice, it hates these things, but always with an eye towards our love for you and what you've done. Help us to keep our heads above the water of uh, a worldly good life, and help us to seek and pursue you in all that we do, and always, always, always beginning with what we celebrate here, your blood and your body broke, shed and broken for us, that we might be called sons and daughters of God. It's in Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. This week. Good morning again. Welcome to Prairie View Christian Church. Thanks for joining us. Happy Labor Day weekend for those here in the room and those joining us online. Uh, Joshua texted me about 10 minutes ago in the middle of the service and said we have an all-time high for our live stream right now. Don't know if that's still true. Uh, however, I still tip my cap to the people in the room because you were at church during a global pandemic on a three-day weekend. So tip my cap to you. Well, the closing chapters of the book of Judges record one of the darkest periods in biblical history. In chapters 17 and 18, there's an example of audacious, unashamed idolatry. In chapter 19, there's murder and injustice, 
with a priest, no less, at the center of it. And in chapters 20 and 21, we read of brutal civil war within God's chosen people, Israel. The last verse of Judges gives us a tragic summary of the situation. Judges 21 verse 25 says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. You could use many words to describe the Israelites during the time of the judges. Wicked, lost, rebellious, hardened, ungrateful, stubborn, just to name a few. But there's one word that you probably wouldn't use to describe Israel, and that word is this, faithful. But then you turn the page and you encounter a small and unassuming book called Ruth. Verse 1 tells us that the events in the book of Ruth occur in the days when the judges ruled, which, as we just summarized, were not exactly Israel's finest hour. But out of this depraved and unfaithful time in Israel's history comes a wonderful story that doesn't exactly fit in its context. From the days when the judges ruled, days of sin, days of idolatry, murder, injustice, and civil war, out of those days comes an unexpected and beloved story of faithfulness. So open your Bibles to the book of Ruth. Feel free to follow along wherever you are, but before we do any reading, let's pray. Lord, again, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time that we have together. Thank you for the book of Ruth. Thank you that for many of us who have tried one-year Bible reading plans, we might get to the book of Judges sometime in early March, and by the time we get to the end of the book, we're about ready to pack it in because there are so many sad, frustrating, horrible things that we read. But then right when things get really dark in Israel's history, we see this small light. And so, Lord, thank you for the book of Ruth. I pray that right now, in dark moments of our own lives, in dark moments of history, that we would look for the little lights that you send us, whether it's a card from a friend who's praying for us, whether it's a brother or sister in Christ who helps us or serves us, Whether it's Sunday morning, in this time of uncertainty and darkness, we still have Sunday morning. Lord, thank you for these small lights that remind us of who you are and what you're doing and how good you are, even during dark times. Lord, thank you for those who are here this morning. Thank you for those who are joining us online. I pray that our worship would be honoring to you, that this time that we have together would be helpful and beneficial for us as we go out in the coming week and serve you. And Lord, we thank you for Jesus, the ultimate faithful redeemer that not just the book of Ruth points us to, but the entire Bible points our eyes to Jesus. Lord, thank you for Christ. Thank you for our redeemer. We ask this all in his name. Amen. Well, starting in Ruth chapter 1, verse 1. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man of Bethlehem and Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malan and Chilion. They were Apathrites from Bethlehem and Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. They lived there about ten years, and both Malin and Chilion died, so that the woman, Naomi, was left without her two sons and her husband. Maybe you've picked up a book before, and you've read a book, and you've seen so many characters that you cannot possibly keep everyone straight. 
You're having to get on Wikipedia. You're having to look to the back of the book to keep people straight. Who's this person? Who's this person? Who's married to who? Who's related to who? Well, let's make sure we avoid that in the first few verses of Ruth. So first we have Elimelech, who's married to his wife, Naomi. And then they have their two sons in Bethlehem. But then when a famine arrives, they head to Moab in search of food. And it's worth noting that Elimelech likely sold the family's land before they moved. That will be an important detail later in the story. And while living in Moab, Elimelech and Naomi's two sons, Malan and Chilion, get married to two Moabite women, Orpah and Ruth. Now, this would not have been a problem for the two sons, so long as their non-Israelite wives would have agreed to abandon their false Moabite gods and worship the one true God of Israel. And the story seems to imply that both women, Orpah and Ruth, did just that. But then over time, all three of the men of the story, Elimelech, Naomi's husband, and Malin and Chilion, Naomi's sons, all men die. That leaves the three women, Naomi, Orpah, and Ruth, with no husbands and no sons. Now, being a widow in any time is extremely difficult, but it was even more so in the ancient world. That was true for Orpah and Ruth, the two younger women of the story. But it was especially true for Naomi, being much older. In the ancient world, widows, especially an old widow with no sons, may have been reduced to begging or worse just to survive. One commentator describes Naomi's situation this way. From wife to widow, from mother to childless, Naomi is stripped of all identity. The security of husband and children, which a male-dominated culture afforded to women, is hers no longer. Stranger in a foreign land, Naomi is a victim of death and of life. So Naomi advises Orpah and Ruth to go back to their families, find new husbands, start over while they still can. Naomi may not have any hope, but her younger daughters-in-law still do. But that's when we hear the book's namesake, Ruth, speak up for the first time. And she delivers some of the most moving and memorable words in the entire Old Testament. You may have heard them quoted at weddings. Ruth chapter 1, verse 16. But Ruth said to Naomi, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. Orpah goes home. She starts over. And for what it's worth, the book does not seem to judge her or look down on her or demonize her for it. But Ruth refuses to leave her mother-in-law. They return to Bethlehem with no real plan in place. They really are living on a prayer. It is a great risk for Ruth to attach herself to Naomi. Ruth has an uncommon showing of faithfulness. The story continues in chapter 2, verse 1. Now Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him, in whose sight I shall find favor. And she said to her, Go, my daughter. So she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the clan of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem. And he said to the reapers, 
the Lord be with you. And they answered, the Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his young man who was in charge of the reapers, whose young woman is this? And the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, she is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, Please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. So she came, and she has continued from early morning until now, except for a short rest. Then Boaz said to Ruth, Now listen, my daughter. Do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. Then Ruth fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes, that you should take notice of me, since I am a foreigner? But Boaz answered her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me. How you left your father and mother and your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. The Lord repay you for what you have done, and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Then Ruth said, I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. So in their desperation, Ruth went out to collect food from fields that were not hers. Remember, Elimelech sold the family's land when they left for Moab. Maybe Ruth was banking on the fact that the Old Testament law instructed the people of Israel to care for widows, orphans, foreigners, especially when it came to food. Farmers were instructed to leave the edges of their fields unharvested. That way those vulnerable people groups could scavenge what was left. And thankfully... By chance, of course, Ruth comes to the field of the righteous and generous Boaz. Boaz had heard of what Ruth had done, and Boaz accepts, welcomes, provides for, and protects Ruth. Now, when Ruth goes home to tell Naomi that she met Boaz, it's like Naomi has been given a new lease on life. Chapter 2, verse 20 Naomi says, May he be blessed by the Lord, whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. It turns out, by mere coincidence, I'm sure, that Boaz is a distant relative. And Boaz holds the keys to redeeming the futures of both Naomi and Ruth. So Naomi, the clever slightly desperate old woman that she is, tells Ruth exactly what to do next. Ruth is to go under the cover of night and lay next to Boaz. Now, some commentators and some preachers have tried to make this part of the story a little bit more, shall we say, steamy than it probably is. They've tried to make it a little more sensational, a little more titillating. But make no mistake, Ruth going and laying next to Boaz is certainly a romantic gesture. We see in chapter 3, verse 6, So Ruth went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had commanded her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. Then Ruth came softly and uncovered his feet and lay down. At midnight, the man was startled and turned over. And behold, a woman lay at his feet. He said, who are you? You'd say the same thing. And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. With those words, Ruth is not just humbly requesting Boaz's compassion and care. Ruth is boldly challenging Boaz to step up to the plate and be the redeemer God calls him to be. And unsurprisingly, given what we read of Boaz in chapter 2, 
he does just that. Once again, Boaz proves himself to be righteous. Verse 10, And Boaz said, May you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. You have made this last kindness greater than the first, and that you have not gone after young men, whether poor or rich. That tells us that Boaz was likely significantly older than Ruth. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you ask, for all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. And now it is true that I am a redeemer. Yet there is a redeemer nearer than I. Remain tonight and in the morning. If he will redeem you, good. Let him do it. But if he is not willing to redeem you, then as the Lord lives, I will redeem you. Lie down until the morning. So it turns out that there are some complications that Boaz will have to work out in order to redeem Naomi's land, in order to marry Ruth. Technically, there's another distant family member who would have had first dibs. But Boaz is a smart man. He calls a meeting with the local community leaders, including the other guy. And with some strategic speech, Boaz accomplishes his goal. He fulfills his promise to Ruth. Naomi receives back the land that her husband sold and is no longer homeless. Boaz and Ruth are married, so she's no longer on her own. In the short term, both women are redeemed. In the long term, Boaz and Ruth have a son together. And thus, in a way, Elimelech and Naomi's family line is redeemed as well. We read in chapter 4, verse 14, the women of Bethlehem say, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a Redeemer, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Now, it's a touching and inspiring story, isn't it? It's certainly a welcome change of pace coming out of those horrific final chapters in the book of Judges. It's a story of suffering and loss, followed by redemption and blessing. Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz all get a happy ending. You know, honestly, I'm a bit surprised that Disney has not taken this and run with it. Ruth could be a great princess. Boaz could be an ideal knight in shining armor. All you need is a talking animal sidekick. But this isn't meant to be just a warm and fuzzy love story. It isn't meant to be read as a fairy tale. There's much more to the book of Ruth than that. As we think about what we Christians today might take away from this Old Testament story, what this story might tell us about God, our world, and ourselves. We could go in multiple different directions. We could focus on the faith of Naomi. How even in her darkest moments of despair, when she felt that she had been abandoned by God, Naomi is still a woman of faith. After all, the fact that Naomi believes God is the one who did this to her, in and of itself, displays her faith in him. In that sense, she follows in the footsteps of other faithful sufferers in the Bible, figures like Moses or Job or Jeremiah. Naomi was a woman of faith. Or we could focus on the faithfulness of Ruth. After all, the book is named after her. This unlikely heroine, a foreign woman, is a living, breathing display of God's faithfulness. In the days when the judges ruled, when unfaithfulness spread like wildfire, there was at least one faithful woman in Israel. And ironically, she wasn't even from Israel. Or we could focus on the righteousness of Boaz. Boaz puts the interests of others ahead of his own at personal cost and risk. He has compassion on those for whom God has compassion, widows and foreigners. 
And he righteously steps up to the challenge when given the opportunity to go the extra mile. Boaz becomes Naomi's redeemer and Ruth's redeemer and an entire family's redeemer. Now, those are all perfectly reasonable, perfectly appropriate takeaways from this story. But they shouldn't be the only ones. Because this story is just as much about God as it is about Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz. We see God's provision at work in the finer details of this story. I mean, come on, can we really believe that Ruth and Boaz's encounter in that field was mere chance or coincidence? Of course not. One commentator writes, The idea of Ruth's meeting with Boaz as chance is nothing more than the author's way of saying that no human intent was involved. For Ruth and Boaz, it was an accident, but not for God. The tenor of the whole story makes it clear that the narrator sees God's hand throughout. This is a story about God's provision. Provision for a suffering widow, a faithful foreigner, and a righteous Israelite. And we Christians today are part of this same story, just a little bit further down the line. And God's hand is still writing it. God's hand already has written it. We also see that God accomplishes this provision through the actions of people. God calls people, people like Naomi and Ruth and Boaz, to be tools in his hand. He uses people like you and people like me to accomplish his purposes in the world. Now, God doesn't need our help to do what he intends to do. He's God for God's sake. But he graciously invites us to participate in what he's doing. And he uses us to make it happen for his glory. Again, the same commentator says, not only Boaz's faithfulness, and Naomi's risky plan, but also Ruth's accidental steps are part of the control God affects over his world behind the scenes and in the shadows. As Zach mentioned just a few minutes ago, sometimes God doesn't work in the big, amazing miracles that pop up out of the sky. Sometimes he works through people like you and people like me small, seemingly uneventful, and normal gestures are part of what God uses to accomplish his plans in the world. And then finally, we also learn something about God's far greater plan of redemption in this story, the one that goes far beyond the individual fates of Ruth, Naomi, and Boaz. Looking at chapter 4, verse 17, And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, referring to the baby of Ruth, Naomi's granddaughter, grandson, excuse me. A son has been born to Naomi, and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Verse 22 emphasizes it again. Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered David. It turns out that God's kindness to these three people isn't just about them. It's about his much bigger plan of redemption for sinners, stretching all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Ruth gives birth to Obed. From Obed we get Jesse. And from Jesse we get David. And from the line of David comes the true, eternal Redeemer, Jesus Christ. The Son of David. The Son of God. So this story would not be the last time that God would provide for his people, using his people to accomplish his great plan of redemption. It wouldn't be the last time that an unlikely woman would display uncommon faithfulness at great personal cost. A young virgin named Mary would one day do the same. We read about her earlier in the service. And this wouldn't be the last time that a righteous man In fact, the righteous man, far greater than Boaz, 
would redeem those who fell at his feet in humble desperation. This story points our eyes ahead to the greatest redeemer, Jesus Christ, the one who lived a sinless life, died for the sins of others, rose from the dead, and one day will return. From the days when the judges ruled, from a period marked by mankind's unfaithfulness, we get a story of God's faithfulness. From those days when there was no king in Israel, we see a preview of the true king, not only of Israel, but of all creation. From the days when everyone did what was right in his own eyes, God accomplishes his purposes through a suffering widow, a faithful foreigner, and a righteous man. From a small, unassuming book tucked away in the Old Testament, we don't just get a cute love story or a nice fairy tale. We get an example within his much greater plan of God's steadfast love, his loyalty, his generous action, his eternal grace, his everlasting fidelity, his unceasing kindness. And we get a preview of the one true Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, again, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time we have together. Thank you for your word, the parts that we know well, the parts that we don't know very well at all. Thank you that as we read the Old Testament, as we read the New Testament, as we read small books and big books, familiar stories and unfamiliar stories, we're reading your story. We're reading the story that you've written about redeeming sinners through Jesus Christ. And right now, we are participating in that story. We know what the end of the story is going to be, but at this moment, you call us. You invite us to participate in it. You call us to be your people when formerly left to ourselves, we are not your people. You call us out of sin and into righteousness. You call us out of unbelief into faith. You call us out of death into life the way you did Naomi and Ruth and Boaz. And Lord, you accomplish this for us by faith in your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for our true eternal redeemer. Thank you for the one who spread his wings over us and redeemed us by spreading out his arms on the cross and dying for us. Thank you for Christ's broken body and shed blood. Thank you that you've given us your spirit. Thank you that you've given us your words so that we can read about who you are and what you've done. And thank you for this church, the opportunity we've had to read your word this morning and worship you. I pray you were glorified today. We love you. We ask this all in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing. For those who are here for the first time, post reopening. We have a worship video by Mark, our worship minister. You're welcome to stay and sing these three songs. If you'd rather go ahead and exit the building, you're more than welcome to do that, but we do invite you to stay.
down inside myself Anger in the waves, oh, he is my son Let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins The echo of my days, oh, he is my son You are concludes our worship service for this morning. If you have any questions about what it means to trust in Christ as your eternal Redeemer, talk to one of the elders, talk to one of the pastors here. We'd be happy to pray with you, speak with you, answer your questions, do whatever it is that we can do to help. With that, I'll close our service in prayer. Lord, again, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this time that we've had together to worship you I pray that it's been honoring to you. I pray that it's been good for us. I pray that going out into the week ahead with whatever it might hold in store for us, which none of us in this room knows what that is for sure, I pray that we would trust in you as our faithful Redeemer. No matter what unexpected events might occur, no matter what kinds of sufferings or losses we could theoretically sustain, no matter what kind of victories we might achieve, I pray that we would keep our eyes fixed on you as our faithful Redeemer. Lord, thank you for these people. Thank you for this morning. Thank you for this time that we've had together to worship you. We love you. We glorify you. And we thank you for Jesus. We ask this all in his name. Amen. Have a great week. What it means to die